it's this has been a long time coming and I just want to start off could you please introduce yourselves my name is Edna Gunn I was born Edna Warner and this is my husband Edgar and we've been together for 73 years and we have eight children and 18 grandchildren and we just had our 31st great-grandchild. I'm Edgar Gunn. <laughs> <clears throat> what else am I supposed to say? <laughs> Tell where you were born. Well, I was born in Greenfield and uh, moved around considerable. Went in the Navy in Rockville, Connecticut. Then moved up here afterwards and married this little gal. And here we are. How did you first meet? I was working for her father, T.L. Warner. She was walking out to go somewhere one morning, out by the garage over there. And I, I came in to go to work, and I said to her, cold, isn't it? And that was our first... Words. <laughs> words. Yep. What was your response? <laughs> I probably agreed with him, <laughs> but it was only in September. <laughs> and it went from there. Yep. And I was born here in Sunderland. Uh, April 1st, 1928, at, at Nellie Abbey's maternity home on North Main Street. The little brown, mung, the brown bungalow house on the right-hand side, it was run by, um, it was run by my grandmother's sister, who was an Ingram from Leverett. And then it eventually went into a sort of a mm, elderly home. Um, I don't know much about the history of it. I don't know how it started, or but I know it was there. Yep. That's what it was for, was for uh, new mothers. And I remember my mother told me she had to stay there for two weeks. <laughs> Some different from today. And I spent my all my life in Sunderland. Uh, I went to school in Sunderland, grammar school in Sunderland, and graduated from Amherst High. And spent one year at Mass State College. And then he came along and that was it. And we've been doing things ever since. <laughs> Where are all your kids located now in? All of our children uh, are in New England. Two in Maine, one in Vermont, two in Connecticut, and the rest in Massachusetts. Our grandchildren are uh, go from Iowa to South Carolina to Tennessee and Quite a few right here in Massachusetts. Um, grand, great grandchildren are scattered. The latest one, the latest one, was born in Springfield, and lives in Hamden. Uh, lives in uh, East Long Meadow. And but we have great grandchildren in Tennessee, South Carolina, Vermont, and Maine, and we just. <laughs> Spread around. What are the family reunions like when you can all get together? Now, I would imagine that you have family reunions here. We used to have uh, Christmas together, as many as could make it. And the family got so big that we switched to August and we had an outdoor picnic. Still don't get everybody here, but anybody that can make it. We, we have had as many, over 50 but uh, haven't had any the last couple of years. So we just take whatever happens to be available. Name your kids from youngest, oldest to youngest. Oldest is Christine, 
Judith, Elizabeth, Cynthia, Edgar Jr., Teresa, Gregory, and Catherine. Could you tell me something about your childhood and growing up in Sutherland and where exactly were you raised? Which house or whatever? And that house, right north of us. That was my home place all my life until I got married. Uh, there was no organized activities for kids back then, but we pretty much had the run of the whole street. And we used bicycles a lot. We went all kinds of places on our bicycles. We used to swim at the rocks in North Thumbland, go up on our bikes and no adult, no adult supervision. We were pretty much on our own. And for the most part, there was a group of kids right here in this area. And we just went out and around. And when it was time to eat lunch, my mother would come out on the porch and blow a big whistle, like a policeman's whistle. So we knew it was time to come home and eat. <laughs> How many brothers and sisters do you have? Did you I have? had five siblings, three brothers and two sisters. And could you name them, please? My oldest sister was named Louise, and then Robert, and Elizabeth, and Edward, myself, and Theron Jr., better known as Terry. <laughs> Going back to uh, growing up on the, uh, on the street, could you give me some idea as to about how many kids were are roaming the streets or what? Or? Well, right here in this very close area, uh, Marilyn Montague, Shirley Goodwin, Charlie Hepburn, Kay Hepburn, Mary Clark, Lorraine Graves, myself, Millie Warner was up a little ways. That was pretty much the core of who was around at that time. And my younger brother was always hanging around with us too. What was the elementary school like? Going to school. <laughs> uh, we walked to school, walked home for lunch, walked back to school, and then back home after school. Um, eight grades we had. Uh, famous Mrs. Dill was still there when I was there. Uh, and apparently my mother had her when she first started to teach. Um, Tell me a little bit about the famous Mrs. Dill. She was uh, a strong disciplinarian. I never got hit by the knuckles, but I saw kids that were. Uh, and when I was in eighth grade, I had the unknown at the time mono, and they didn't know what it was. I ended up in the hospital for a week until they began to use penicillin. And, but while I was there, my, we had two grades in the room. So my younger brother was in seventh grade, I was in eighth grade. <laughs> and she tried to get information from my brother as to where, my whereabouts, he wouldn't say anything. So she called up my folks and wanted to know if, uh, I couldn't come and be in the teacher's room just so she could. She was a great, perfect attendance person and just loved to have that banner in her room. And my mother said, nope, sorry, she's in the hospital. And so I was off for about a month and then went back to school, got over it, and didn't know how sick I was until it was all over. And I was, they, my throat was closing up on me until it was Dr. Lowe and Greenfield who came up with penicillin and I felt like a pincushion when I came home, but it did the job. Yep. Do you, transportation wise, you, your family had a car and everything like that? My father had, was the only driver, we had one car. We didn't go anywhere unless he went, and therefore, we were pretty restricted to town. 
And so we had to make our own amusements and we did okay. We didn't have any problem. No, nope, we organized our own backyard ball game or whatever and we just didn't have anything that was organized. I never went to the movies. I never went to the movies until I was well into my teens because we didn't go anywhere unless my father went. And if my father was going somewhere at such and such a time, if we weren't there, we didn't get to go. <laughs> what did your father do for work? My father uh, graduated from, uh, yeah, what do you call it? Before, before um, State College. Oh, what Mass Aggie? What's that? Mass Aggie? Ma yeah, Mass Aggie. And well, went to work for the government as an engineer and was participated in, in uh, marking the, the uh, boundary between the United States and Canada. And he worked in Puerto Rico, but he came home, uh, I think he came home er, probably around 1910, 1912, and to help his father on the farm. And he and his brother Raymond ran the farm, and then he organized his construction company in 1928. And it was Warner Brothers at that time. Afterwards, joined by a, a retired state engineer, Harold Goodwin. So it was Warner Brothers and Goodwin. Uh, they did a lot of odd jobs uh, to begin with. They didn't really start construction until later. I don't know just when, but later on. And so I did a lot of riding with him when he started the construction jobs. I was always interested in what was going on. Uh, and he kept kept at it. It was garaged over here next door uh, until they bought the place um, that used to be the Sunland Bank building up mm -hmm. next to the town hall, the old town hall. And then he turned it over to Bob and Edward and Terry. And retired later on and was town clerk and right. now the uh the one thing that uh edgar the uh you're working with um mm -hmm. construction and driving trucks right mm -hmm. when you transition from that to working at the, the uh, oxford pickle or canes you you oh, you no. were I, i've driven truck all my life and then we had our own business in in the 50s and 60s our own trucking outfit, Greenfield Springfield Express. And then that didn't work out, so I went back to work for Oxford Pickle, and then I moved on from there to the freight companies in Springfield. Long distance driving. My question is that we have all now GPS to take and tell us exactly where to go, when to turn, how far it is before we make the turn, and when's the next turn going to happen. How did you find, how did the, the whole thing of traveling and going long distance traveling, how was that back then? And we're talking what, uh, 50s and 60s at this point here? 70s and 80s. Okay, 70s, yeah. The start of the interstate highway system. Yep. Yeah, the, when the interstate came in, it was beautiful compared to the old roads. And by then he was going from uh, terminal to terminal, not doing individual. For Oxford, he did a lot of delivering. And that was, for a lot of us, that was summer, summer work. Summer work, right. Summer work. I started in cutting onions for my uncle and then it was cucumbers and potatoes and tobacco and I got my license when I was 17 so I could drive the truck from the field to the barn 
because by legally, but you were doing that before. <laughs> <laughs> but that was because at that time it was during the World War Two, and uh, all the young men were in the service, so he had to rely a lot on us girls, and he did. We did a lot of work for him. Yep. How how did the depression affect the family? Do you remember that or? I don't remember it. Okay. As far as I was concerned, it was status quo. My older brothers and sisters, who are seven to 13 years older than I, remember parts of it that I don't. But I remember my sister telling me that my father apparently got behind on his mortgage and offered his house to the bank and the bank didn't want it. So he kept taking away and ended up paying off his mortgage. Yep. But I was clothed, I was, my mother did a lot of sewing, I was fed. The only thing I really remember is selling raspberries out by the road. That's the only thing I can, other than that, it was the same old thing. Living in the country made it much easier. Yeah. But I remember when there used to be um, the WPA and the CCC, but I don't. I wasn't involved in it, but I remember it being around. And I know Ed's father worked with the WPA. So. So I know you've uh, uh, reached a, a little bit about you know the uh, your friends and neighbors and that stuff. But are there anyone, any of your uh, neighbors or your friends that are still around here that you still stay in contact with? Can't say they're all gone. Oh. I'm the only one that I know of that's left. Yep. Yeah. Except for Helen Clark. No, oh, she wasn't our. She wasn't in our age group. No. But Helen. She's still around. She's still around, but it was her older sister that was my age, and she just passed away last spring, I think. Now, Edgar, growing up, you said in Greenfield, correct? No, I was born in Greenfield. And where did you grow up? Oh, <laughs> uh, all over Mass and in Connecticut, a few places. Ended up in Rockville and then went in the Navy. And then moved up to Sunland. His father was a farm worker, so he went from different farms. That's why he did so much moving. How many brothers and sisters did you have? One. One. Just one brother. Yeah, he's gone now. How what what how would you take and surmise your your life here on uh, South Main Street with Edna and the families around here? Very good. I've been very fortunate. I have a beautiful family here. Always had work. What he disliked was having to drive to Springfield and back after driving all day. <laughs> no, I didn't <laughs> like that. I enjoyed our business when we had it, but I wasn't really a good businessman. <clears throat> you just like to take you know, the, the bookkeeping aspect of it or just the... <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> Edna was good at it. He did the running and the delivering. <laughs> and the mechanics. <clears throat> Unbelievable. Now, let's see. Uh, you've already uh, kind of hinted about the funny memories of the school and that. So, other than, let's go back to the famous Mrs. Dill. <laughs> <laughs> so, after you graduated and moved on, and the famous Mrs. Dill still lived across the street from you. Yes. Yep, just down a few houses. Yep, she did. And my brother didn't like her. My, he was a year younger than I. He used to stand up and to recite and turn around and look out the window. He was not very respectful. But uh, they got through it. And uh, I just... I, I had no complaint about her, but she was a strict teacher. She was a strict teacher, yes. Any complaints would have been... <laughs> yeah. 
she was great for doing for having us do book reports and uh, well when I got to Amherst High School the teacher the English teacher used to say she knew exactly who came from Sunderland because they knew their grammar thanks to Mrs. Dill <laughs> Thinking back, was there any uh, events while you were growing up that still kind of stick in your mind today? Something that just pops? Probably the, well, the flood of the flood and the hurricane. Both of those I remember hurricane well. Hurricane and 38. The, the hurricane, I mean the flood yeah. in 1936. Uh, I remember how it rained, and my father came up at noon time to take, get us out of school. He took us over to see the ice jam by the bridge, and midnight that night the fire siren went off, and we had to evacuate. And we went down and spent the rest of the night down at George C. Hubbard's down at the corner of Plum Tree, and we came home and the water hadn't even come up to our house. It came up at the end of the street, but did not come up to our house. So we just came home. And the hurricane, a group of us girls were playing house in the corn crib across the street, behind the house, down behind the barn. And we were hanging up burlap bags to keep the rain up from coming in. And Carol Goodwin, who lived in the house at that time, came down all of a sudden and said, didn't you kids know there was a hurricane? Well, we didn't even know what a hurricane was. <laughs> and he sent us home. And as it came out, we were just as safe where we were than we were running across the street. But uh, two, two uh, trees went down out front here and, and captured a car from Virginia. So the people from Virginia stayed overnight with us, went on the next day. And I also remember the cigarette salesman's uh, truck that was squashed by the elm tree up the street just a little ways. Other than that, I don't remember too much about it, except seeing pictures of it afterwards, hmm. because my father didn't take us around to look at anything. <laughs> he was busy doing his own thing, <laughs> but those are the really the most tremendous things, I think, that I can remember. My mother uh, often told about, uh, well, of course, going back to the, uh, the bridge going down in the uh, ice flows in the 36, and that going over, uh, crossing the river in the little dinghy uh, to get on to South Airfield to, for my grandmother to take and go to work. We brought you know, my mother there. We were ferried across the river. Have you? We just heard that it had gone out, and tell what you did. Well, we <clears throat> we came out of Asheville. Uh, uh, we were my father uh, left a job up there on a farm, and we came across the bridge up in uh, oh, what's Spruce the name? Corners. Spruce Corners, the other side of Asheville. That bridge went out just after we went over it. And then we came down and uh, went over the Sunland Bridge. And the next day, that bridge went out. <laughs> we went up and stayed with the Roses. They're our relative. His grandparents were the Roses in North Sunderland. So once the bridge went down, how long did you go on the ferry back and forth? Tell I don't remember, oh, okay. but I know my father uh, used the bank, the Produce National, in South Deerfield. And so I used to go uh, across with him. How we went from the bank in South, I mean the river bank in South Deerfield to the center of town, I don't remember. But I remember going across in the boat. Um, And then they built a temporary bridge, and until and while they were, then they constructed the present bridge, 
And at that time, Ben Tuz, before the flood, had a small filling station down on what's now School Street. And he moved over to where the garage is now and built the garage and the and the, and the house where the where the liquor store is was a soda fountain. And uh, I remember seeing men from the making the bridge coming over to have lunch at the yep yep I remember that quite the entrepreneur. <laughs> yes, he was. Let's speak about the uh, the new bridge. That kind of changed the center of town too. There was there was nothing between where where um, where the center where the uh, convenience store is now and the chapel. That's where the road that's where the road went. There was a little house, uh, probably about, about where the store is, and Garage Road used to come out right about where. 116 came right across there, but it used to be a, a triang triangle entrance to Garage Road with a flagpole and it went straight. It didn't uh, curve like it does now. And um, and there was a, a vacant building. I don't know what was there. Uh, right on the corner of School Street, across from the uh, Graves Library, and that was eventually moved up to North Silver Lane, where um, my relatives well, lived. Wanda Yes, and yes, yep. yep. And during the Second World War, we had a great big scrap iron collection on that corner. Um, yeah, that, it did change the town, the center of town, that's for sure. What was your first job besides working on the farm? Did you always work farm and housework or? No. Nope. Okay. No. Nope. Lawn, more lawn, push lawn, push more. But mostly I worked for my uncle. Whatever farm work there was to do, that's where I worked. Even when I was in high school, I used to come home and, and uh, he had the tobacco seedlings. I was back and I'd be there picking out the weed and yep, yeah, anything. As long as I could earn a dime, I did it. <laughs> Speaking of a dime, how much were you, were you getting paid for all that? Oh, I used to mow lawn for 25 cents and I meant the whole lawn <laughs> and that was pushing a lawn mower. <laughs> Think nothing of it. That was, yeah. that was money from my, in my pocket. So. One of the things is uh, you met, you courted. What was your wedding like? Small. <clears throat> hot. Hot. It was hot. Sweat burning down my back. September. <laughs> oh, I thought maybe it was going to say December. <laughs> nope. September, and it was hot and muggy, and I looked over at him, and his sweat was pouring off the end of his nose, and it was going down my spine. <laughs> It was hot, yep, but it was not a, a big wedding. We got married in the church up here, and the reception was at home. Uh, that was about it. Where did you live after you got married? Across the street. At my grandmother's, at my Mike, own, Mike Wisman owns now. Farm there. We lived, for a few months we lived with my grandmother, and Dick and Shirley Graves were in the apartment upstairs. And when they bought the place next door and moved over here, then we took over the apartment. And we were there until 51, so that was about four years. And then we came over here. Yep. Did they kick you out over there that you had to come over here? Or how, how, how did moving across the street happen? Well. We bought this house. <laughs> from her parents. Next and we door. walked our stuff across the street, pretty much. We had one of those um, outdoor swing sets. Mm -hmm. We walked it across the street. <laughs> yep, and we've been here ever since. May I ask, 
how much was the purchase price of this house? Well, at the time it was about $12,000. No, 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 not when we bought it. That was our first loan. When we yeah. bought it, it was about 7500 And then we took uh, out a, a, a loan so we could put yeah. in a oil furnace. The furnace. Yep. 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 <clears throat> it's given him a lot of work. And at that time... We've been working on it ever since. <laughs> when I was growing up, there was a, a barn, hay barn. But that was gone by the time we got here. And we built the garage in 64. And before that, there was just an old shed extension on the back of the house. This was a uh, rental house or a... Two, two story. Worker, I mean, uh, worker's house yeah, yeah. for her Two father. apartments, two apartments. Duplex. Duplex, yes. Yep. Al... Uh, Al Adamski. Al Adamski and Red Whitney lived here. They worked for my father. So when when Red and Ruth moved up where Rick lives now, we moved in here in the north side. And in the spring, later on in the, the next year, 52, Al and Esther moved up next to the old town hall. And then we opened up one barrier and took over the house. Alan Esther, last name Adamski, correct? They yes. what? Uh, Alan Esther Adamski. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yep. Yep. So what what big things did you do in the house here to take? And uh, must everything, but what was a couple of, uh, as your family expanded, what did you do um, in this house here? The outside has now changed at all, it seems. Pretty there, much the yeah, same. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think originally it was built as a salt box because we've had carpenters point out different factors that show that. And in fact, the beam that runs across the front of the house in the attic is tapered like this and the roof goes up here. So it definitely was different. And sometime or other, they added the second floor on the back. and. Uh, we don't. We have no record as to when it was done, but I remember it being two family when I was growing up, and uh, until we got here and opened it up again, um, I don't know how many years it was. But we've done a lot of work on the back of the house here. Construction underneath, all new rafters here. <clears throat> the other side. Oh, there's so much work been done I can't <laughs> even remember. This oh. kitchen was uh, had the original uh, big chimney with fireplace. Yeah, it was a chimney right here. And but we needed the space, so we took out the. In fact, the kids took the chimney down. He took he took it down to the roof. And then the older girls took it brick by brick down to the floor, and uh, I had a chute out the win upstairs window into my dump truck, and, <laughs> and the then, kids took most of it down. Yep. <clears throat> and when they took out that used to be a pantry, and when they took out the beehive oven. It was like talcum powder because they had used mud to insulate the oven, okay? So there was a window on the north side of the pantry and he and my brother Terry shoveled it out the window and the dust went everywhere. <laughs> it was quite a job. And then we took the whole thing and made it into a, a kitchen. Yep. Let's talk about a little bit about the, when you were in the house here and that stuff, uh, waking up to a red glow in the morning. 
the uh, big barn fire over Clusa and uh, Benjamin's. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Because that was a biggie. We're thinking the whole town didn't burn down. You were working for um, Oxford or yeah. DM Jewett or somebody, whoever it was, and you had to go out at one o'clock. He got up for one o'clock, and we could see the reflection on the house next door, and we thought it was Scotty Hepburn's barn at the time, and he went off to work. I stayed up and ironed because I could not go back to sleep. And then we found out what barn it was, and those poor cows, oh dear, <laughs> was not good. But fortunately, the houses were safe. I remember the uh, second house up, not this one, but where Rocky Warner lives now. Yeah. Was, that, was that a Warner, Warner's house? That was my brother's. Bob and Hazel built that. There was a farmhouse. That's, I'm going back that far. Yes, there was a farmhouse there with a big cattle barn. Yep. And uh, at the end of the owner, well, actually, uh, Rock's grandfather, Jim, uh, ran a dairy farm there. And then he auctioned, he gave it up and auctioned off. Um, I don't know how old I was, but I must have been maybe eight or, or thereabouts, because I remember the auction. And my uncle Clarence Clark bought it and rented it, rented the house, two apartments, and then Scotty Hepburn ran a dairy in the barn, and then Ralph Hepburn did before it was demolished. Um, I don't remember it being demolished. I remember it was burned. Uh, I don't think I, it burned. I, I, I thought they burned the barn down or something. Not that I can okay, remember. Sorry. Okay. No, uh, okay. I don't remember it being burned. No, no. I don't. Um, um, I remember the other one burning north of it. Right. There was this uh, um, farmhand, John Goldie. Oh yes, oh, Fat yeah. John. Yeah. Huh? Fat John. We call John Goldie. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, John Goldie because he was a, uh, he to me was the typical hardworking farmer. He was a tenant farmer. Yeah. Yep. And he rode the rails spring and fall. He was a typical hobo. But he lived in a outbuilding out back of the farm. It was, and like, a, it was like a shed. Mm. What? Yes. It was like a shed. Yep. And uh, yep. rode a bicycle. He grew onions across the street on my grandfather's lot. And never did anything out of the ordinary, as far as I know. He was always very friendly. And and uh, but we used to call him Fat John. <laughs> I remember his big ass bike that he pedaled around. It was. Yep. Big seat, the handlebars, and you know. he used to go down and, and chat with uh, Stanley Bashevsky. Yep. And one day Stanley was up visiting Fat John. He walked to go home, and we had <laughs> horses at the time. So there was a dead furrow at the end of the, at the side of the pasture, and he went to duck under the electric fence and lay down in the <laughs> in the rut. And one of the kids came in. I guess it was Judy came in and to me and said, "There's a dead man out in the field." So I called up Joe Sadowski, and he came down in his pickup, and he went out, and he got a hold of Stanley, put him in his pickup, and off they went. <laughs> yep, but when when uh, Scotty had cows over here, maybe even when uh, Ralph had them, I don't remember, but the two older girls used to play out in the lawn, and 
the cows every once in, once in a while would get out and they'd come over in the yard. Kids would come in, eyes big as saucers. <laughs> There's cows out here. So I had to go out and chase the cows back over to the farm. <laughs> So they always thought I was so brave to go out and take care of those cows. <laughs> the the other one that I um, I remember on the other uh, used to be Parsons House there. Whose house? The Parsons House, the one that's yeah. now right next to the walkway for the school. There was I, I I can't remember. There was a doctor that lived there, Doctor Doctor Moline. Doctor Moline. Mm-hmm. Was Dr. Moline the neighborhood doctor? Yep, he's the only doctor I ever saw. Uh, and I can remember my father taking me once over to his office because I there used to be a porch on the front of the house and I got a sliver in the bottom of my bare foot. My, doctor, my father always did the doctoring. But he didn't want to attempt that, so he took me over there for him to take out. That's the only time I ever remember going to Dr. Moline. But we used to <clears throat> be friendly with his wife and his daughter. And my kids, when they were growing up, could ride their tricycles up as far as Moline's driveway because that was hard surface. And so they'd go around and then drive back. That's as far as they could go. And at one point, their tricycle squeaked something terrible. So Mrs. Moline came out with her oil can and oiled the tricycle so it wouldn't bother her. <laughs> Very neighborly, right? <laughs> For um, trick-or-treating and that, knocking on her door, and was she short? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. That's... Else, um, yeah. What was her name? Jessie, Jessie. Yes, she was. She worked at at uh, Mass State for that was all. That was her year years work was there because there was a, a woman from South Deerfield who lived on Sugarloaf Street that used to come and pick her up, take her to work, and then drop her off when night. Yep. Do you remember, um, where were you when you heard that uh, JFK was shot? What year was that? 62? Yeah. Okay, that was the year that Gregory was born. I was not doing much of anything except staying home. And Edna Clark called me on the telephone. She had heard it on the radio. That was That's how I found out about it. Other than that, I don't remember anything about it. You had a family to take care of. What's that? You had a family to take care of. Yes, I did. Oh. Seven of them. <laughs> the, uh, I, I can, it's quite obvious. Uh, was it much different growing up when your kids were growing up? The difference between this and that? Or, I think, I think uh, seeing the success of your family and everything, that uh, I think you had uh, good, strong family values and work. Our kids all found something to do, and uh, they didn't have the social distraction that the kids have today. Uh, they didn't have the, the electronic distro distraction. Um, they pretty much had to do almost like what I did. Uh, they had to find their own entertainment, and they did a lot. Uh, it wasn't until Skip was old enough to be on Little, um, Little League that there was any organization for, for anything. Um, nope, they pretty well had to find their own entertainment. And we raised cucumbers out here. Oh. For them in the summertime. And they had to do the work. And they reaped the profits. Yep. <laughs> and Skip and Greg um, had their own lawn mowing business. Uh, and TC and Dee Dee, who is now Skip's wife, 
used to mold the cemetery because Dad was a trustee, and he gave him the job of mowing the cemetery. And so they pretty much earned their... They kept busy. Yes, they did. Yep. <clears throat> yep, I know that for a fact. <laughs> well, one of your sons... Uh... Um, delivered newspapers at the Greenfield. Oh, what, yeah. What's that? One of your sons delivered at Greenfield newspapers. Yep. Which oh, one was that? The two of them did. Okay. In fact, the youngest daughter did. Yep. And then, I, and then it was kind of phased off to John Zakaitis delivering in his car. And then it kind of fell apart. Yep. And the, while Katie was doing it, she busted her ankle twice. So, guess who got to deliver the papers? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was a good job. Yep. Um, clothing differences between then and now. <laughs> Roll your eyes. <clears throat> I'm glad I Fashion. don't have to raise my children today. No way. There's too much electronics. There's too much... Uh, Anti-social work? Nope. I'll go back to the carefree day anytime. <laughs> so that just goes to this other one. What do you appreciate from today that you did not have as a young adult? What do you what do you appreciate today? That I didn't have as a young adult. Yes. Before correct. or after I was married. L let's go let's go after. <laughs> <laughs> we'll narrow it down. <laughs> Well, let's see. What do we have today? Oh, I use my uh, microwave oven often. I still prefer an oven. Uh, we watch one or two programs on the TV. Right. We, <laughs> we used to watch more, but it doesn't interest us anymore. <clears throat> Out. Well, 315. Cell phone. Oh, cell, cell phone. phone. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we have one, but it isn't even on unless we're in the car. Don't use it otherwise. I can, I know I have children that carry it around with them, but not me. It's not for me. And I like it. We like it if we're traveling and we need it for some reason. Other than that, we do not use it. Oh. What about this new technology called email, you know, computer? No, she does some I of have that. a computer and it's pretty much email. Mm -hmm. Don't even go on it once a day. Uh, I have used it to, to uh, buy online some. Not much. Uh, you know, it's mainly email. And then, if I turn it on, what do I get? Everything that I don't want. Because my kids will, <laughs> I, when I first got it, I told them, if you want me, call me on the telephone. Because I'm not on the computer very often. So they, but now every once in a while, they'll send someone We'll send pictures or something, but um, for the most part, doesn't get much use. <clears throat> I'm just not electronically, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> As for me, I'm a klutz with it. Go figure. I um, just want to let's back up a little bit before we wrap this up uh, about the only grocery store. That, you know, there was Toby Sanborn's Little Market just up the street. Yep. And uh, I want you to tell me a little bit about Toby's Sanborn's Market. And then also, um, I know you have to go up and visit John McGrath. Oh, Pittsburgh. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Could you just, uh, let's go back to, let's start off with uh, John. John's store to me was older than Toby Sanborn's, correct? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. John's uh, was where um, Demos. De Demos was. That's where it was when I was growing up, and the post office was right next to it. Uh, he built his store, I think, about uh, 49 maybe or 50, 
in yeah. that area because we were still across the street. Um, you mean the big one in the center? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. but I remember John growing up and uh, walking up to get the mail. Yep, and. Uh, after Bob and Hazel were married, they lived across from the school. So I pick up their mail and take it over to them on my way home. Uh, John McGrath was pretty much a staple in town. John McGrath oh, yeah. was a good old soul. He really was. Yep. And, uh, yep, he <laughs> had to go in there looking for something and it'd be in some other place. And I'd say, John, why did you move that? And so you might buy something else while you're looking for it. <laughs> what about uh, uh, so what was he selling in the in that grocery store? If you close your eyes and just walk me through what the what the inside of the store was like. Everything he had the, a meat counter along the back. Uh, that's where Ralph Hepburn worked for a long time. Um, and of course, Rudy was a main style, mainstay for a long time. Um, but it was pretty much what you go to the grocery for today, except that probably there wasn't so much available. Um, what about Toby Sanborn? Was that Sanborn's market? Did they have a special name or anything like this? Or um, my thing, I rode the bike up. We had. Stole ten cents from my grandfather's bureau drawer and that stuff. We went up there and bought soda and sat on the uh, yeah. Steps. It uh, of course it was a lot smaller, but um, I used to go there. Um, probably he was more of a special team, was wasn't he? I don't know. I was thinking he was he more of a meat specialist. Seems so. Maybe, I, yeah. I, I don't remember for sure. It certainly didn't have. Didn't have room. Didn't have for. what, what John did, but um, it was handy. Mm -hmm. It was very handy when it was the post office. Katie was little when when the post office was there. Dean Scudder was postmaster. And Viola Benjamin was his assistant. Oh, Viola, my goodness, she was an old standby. Um, Don't forget the Corvette that she always had. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> um, it, but uh, Dean used to make a lot of Katie when we'd go in there. I'd sit her up on the counter, he'd take the stamp and he'd stamp her hand, you know. She got quite a kick out of that. Well, to take and wrap this up, basic. Let's just take and, uh, from what I gather, uh, your life here, your family growing up, and everything. Uh, what we could take and sum up at, from this discussion in this little interview is that uh, it was a typical New England Main Street small town. I guess so. Mm hmm. I would say probably it was. Any closing words? What's that? Any closing words? No, we're still here. <laughs> it's been a good life. Yes. We've enjoyed it. <clears throat> Hope for many more. <laughs>